Okay, is that better? Yeah. As, uh, as Harry said, uh, I'm not strictly speaking a scientist or an artist. I'm an anthropologist. But certainly, uh, when I began as an anthropologist about 40 years ago, I thought of myself as being very close to science. I had begun uh, my undergraduate studies in natural sciences and had switched from there to anthropology, but still I felt very close to science and felt that we needed to develop a kind of anthropology that would at least be consistent in what it says about human beings with what science has to say about humans, about their evolution, about their relations with their environment, and so on. And art I, I was, was, was on the other side of the horizon for me. I knew nothing about art. But over, the last, over these 40 years, a strange thing has happened that I felt that art has come closer and closer to what I'm doing, and science has moved further and further away. So that over 40 years, I don't feel that my position has radically changed very much at all. Of course, it's changed a bit, and I've grown, and I've learned, and I know a bit more. Maybe I'm a bit wiser than... I probably know less than I did 40 years ago, but maybe I'm a little bit wiser. But I don't think that I, my overall attitude has changed. But nevertheless, I now find myself talking to people like you, uh, to people in uh, arts practice and arts research, whereas I began talking mostly to scientists. So the question I wanted to start with was, why is that? What has happened to science and art over these last 40 years, such that particularly in the field of um, ecology, the field of our understanding of the environment, which is the area in which I've been most closely concerned, I now feel that science has lost, largely lost, that kind of radical ecological awareness that it had 50 years ago. And that that awareness has now been taken up by art, that art, in a sense, has taken on the mantle of radical ecological awareness that science has lost, and that gives art a very important thing to do in the world, and that's basically the theme of my, my talk. But I want to begin with the idea of data. We are now in living in a world surrounded by data, in which data is one of the most commonly used words um, that, that exists in our vocabulary, and I have to say that I find this slightly terrifying. Datum literally means a thing given. It is something, uh, something that is, is, is given to us as a, as a gift. It comes from the Latin word dare, which is uh, to give. A gift is something that is, is given to you and that is accepted with good grace, and that you often will reciprocate in time, uh, in kind. And anthropologists have written at great length about how the giving and receiving of gifts is of the essence of everyday social life. It's what lubricates our lives in, in conversation, in, in, in exchange. Uh, we are continually giving and receiving, accepting what is given and reciprocating in kind. But that is not what data mean nowadays to most of us, and certainly not in science. For science, collecting data is not a matter of receiving what is given, but of extracting what is not. Data are not received, they are mined, extracted, washed up, deposited, precipitated, by whatever means we go out and extract this stuff. And it comes, this data, comes in bits, in bits, in fragments, that have already been broken off from the currents of life in which they were originally formed, from their ebbs, their flows, and from their mutual entailments. Because for science, even to admit to a relation of, of give and take with things in the world would actually disqualify the inquiry. To be a scientist, you are supposed to be objective, which means that you are supposed to, uh, to acknowledge no debt to the world for what you have received from it. Now, of course, when we talk about data, it is commonly assumed by default that 
these are things to be counted. Uh, they are counted and therefore data are normally understood to be quantitative. Scientists always want to measure things. And there's no, it's no accident that we tend to think of data as things that are counted, because in order to count anything, in order to add things up and to say how many of them we have, you have first to break them off from the currents in which they are formed. You have to divide a world which is all process, all flow, all formation, you have to divide that world into bits. So in order to form a datum, the world has already been divided up. So it's no wonder then that we think that what we do with these data is then count them up. Nevertheless, in my field of, uh, of social anthropology and many other fields of the social sciences, sociology particularly, but many others, it has now got become common to talk about qualitative data. And sociologists say, we deal with both quantitative and qualitative data. And textbooks write about quantitative and qualitative methods, and even talk about quant-qual, and how would some, one should somehow combine the two. The more I think about it, though, the more it seems to me that the idea of a qualitative datum is a contradiction in terms, and not just a contradiction in terms, but that it points to something fundamentally unethical in the constitution of science. Because what is the quality of a thing, except the way in which it reveals itself to you, to your presence, that it, it exists in the way in which something out there in the world opens up to you, so that it becomes part of your own perception, part of what the world has given to you. It is given to you in a relation, a relation of offering up, of giving, and you accepting. And yet in the very moment that you turn that thing's presence to you into a datum, why you turn your back on it. So it's like talking to people, having an honest conversation with people, only to say, I'm not really having a conversation with you, I'm going to write you up. Right? So anthropologists talk a lot about rapport and the importance of establishing rapport with their informants. Very nice, you befriend them, you became good people. But rapport has two senses, friendship and report. And you're just like a double agent, wheedling your way into people's lives so that you can then report on them. And I have a feeling that the very idea of qualitative data carries this ethical doublespeak within it. That there's something fundamentally unethical about it. And this is a matter of, I think, some considerable concern. And it will run through what I have today to, to say today, because I think it's extremely important for um, for art. Uh, but today, uh, of course, the problem with data has become um, even greater. We live in a world now not just of data, but of big data, and of data analytics. Uh, and the, uh, the proliferation of big data is intrinsically connected to the growth of the neoliberal economy of knowledge. Where we know very well that one serves the interests of the other. And in this neoliberal economy of knowledge, life itself has become a disposable commodity. And its forms, whether human or non-human, have become mere grist to the mill of data analytics which are designed to produce results or outputs whose value is judged by their impact or utility rather than by any appeal to truth. This, I think, is a matter of immense concern, that we are dealing with a data economy in which the truth of the matter is a secondary concern. Now, imagine that you have in each of your hands, in this hand, a hard ball, something like a cricket ball, the sort of ball that if you threw it at a window, the window would break. And imagine in this hand you have a soft ball, a, a ball made of something like a, a, a bath sponge, something, something squishy. Now, the scientist works with the hard ball. And he throws, let's, it, it is often a he, but uh, maybe a she, but let, let's say he for now. He, he's throwing this ball uh, 
over and over again at the surfaces of the world, the surfaces that he wants to investigate, and, and incessantly hurtling this ball against it until eventually the surface cracks and he achieves what he calls a breakthrough. And then he receives another surface and he has to throw his ball about that and that cracks too. So science sees the world as this series of resistant surfaces that are, res that are, re that are not willing to give up their secrets, that are holding them back. Uh, this idea about, about science holding back its secrets goes back to Galileo and Francis Bacon, that you had to really trick nature or torture nature or twist nature in order for it to relieve, to, to achieve that breakthrough, to break through the surface with your hard ball. And of course, every hit, every time you hit the surface with this hard ball, that is a datum. That is the way that a hard science operates. And of course, hard science considers itself good science. Um, the, the, the ball, the, this ball, that will do at the most soft science. That's not, not very good. So, with your, with your soft ball, you try doing the same thing, and of course you never achieve a breakthrough, because your ball will never break the surface. It just, it just squishes. But what happens when the ball hits that surface is that it bends a little bit, it deforms, and it takes on into its shape something of the properties of the surface that it hits against. And then maybe the surface isn't quite so hard either, so the surface takes on some of the properties of, of, your, of, of, the, of, of the throw, of the pressure. So you imagine a sort of mutual squishiness in which the ball gets a bit squished and the surface gets a bit squished, and both the ball and the surface take into themselves something of the characteristics of the other. There is what you could call a sort of mutual responsiveness, that the ball responds to the surface it's thrown against, the surface responds to the force of the ball. And I call that mutual responsiveness correspondence. And by correspondence, I don't mean one thing matching up to another. I mean something more like in the old days when people used to write letters to one another. And you'd write somebody a letter about how you're feeling, and they would read it and digest it and mix it with the way they were feeling, and they would write back. And so there would be a, a kind of conversation of letters going back and forth over time. People responding over time to one another. And that kind of correspondence if you will, is a, is a labour of love. It's giving back what we owe to the human or non-human beings with which we share our world, what we owe to them for our own existence and formation. This is what I mean by the give and take of life. We only exist in the world as living, breathing beings, thanks to others, thanks to the world itself, thanks to the people who brought us up, thanks to our mothers who gave birth to us, thanks to the air we breathe, the earth that gives us food and so on. So we owe our existence to the world and the world maybe owes something of their, its existence to us. And correspondence is about that giving and receiving uh, between us and the world. And for me, although many of my colleagues would disagree, um, this is where anthropology comes in because I think of anthropology as a science of correspondence. And its basic way of working, um, which I think is becoming more and more central to art too, our, our central way of working is what we call participant observation. And the idea of participant observation is indeed that you correspond with whatever it is that you're studying. You spend time with them. You listen to what they're saying. And you respond uh, in, in, in a conversation. So this, you set up a kind of dialogue in which the, 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 the sensibilities and ways of being of others become in some sense, part of your own sensibilities. You begin to see things, uh, perceive things, talk about things in the way they do because they become part of you. In fact, this idea, uh, I mean, anthropologists like to think that they, they, they invented this and um, that it all belongs to them. If it, they, of course, they didn't. Um, and in fact, exactly that method of that way of working uh, in any kind of investigation was... Uh, uh, was advocated by, uh, uh, by Goethe uh, at the, um, uh, whenever it was the, the beginning of the, the, the 18th century. Um, Goethe uh, 
uh, advocated a method of science in which he said, if, for example, you are investigating plants, you should go and spend time with your plant. Actually, hours and hours with it, days and days, really getting to know that plant really well so that you begin to see how it moves, how, it, how, it, how, how its little gestures, the way the plant uh, reacts to things, so that you, off, after a while, begin to understand the plant with the plant's own eyes. You become a plant-like being yourself. That's what Goethe recommended, and of course, uh, there is... Uh, a branch uh, or, or movement that is known nowadays as Goethean science, which is viewed by mainstream science with utter contempt, which tells you something about where the problem lies. Because science is curious, or, or at least contemporary science, I'm talking about science today, is, 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 is a curiously restless field. I sometimes think that it's like a marooned spacecraft that has taken off from Earth, is hurtling through space with no idea exactly where it's going, but also no exact idea exactly where it's come from. It is, but it's kept going by an extraordinary optimism, a belief in progress, a belief that whatever, although whatever is discovered now means that what was discovered before was wrong, we are necessarily going in the right direction towards whatever no one actually knows. And, and I, I was very struck when, uh, in, in a, a reading group we had with, with colleagues in science, with my, uh, talk, talking being anthropologists and, and scientists, we were trying to find a common language, and, and, and one of the scientists, a postdoc, said to us that, well, uh, in science we are always told that never to read anything that has been written more than five years ago unless our professors tell us. So they actually knew nothing about the history of their subject. There were great figures uh, in the past, and we were talking about biology mostly and ecology, great figures, uh, people like... Um, People like von Uexkuhl, people like Ludwig von Bertalanffy, great figures in their time who happen not to have become part of the historical narrative, the approved historical narrative had been set to one side, who these people knew absolutely nothing about. Uh, and you had to go to research in the, in the arts and humanities to find out who these people were. I found this profoundly shocking. So, so science is continually cutting itself off from wherever we are now, and in that sense, shooting off into outer space, convinced that it's on the path to a new world, but with no idea what that new world is and having forgotten what the old one is. The humanities have the opposite problem. They are utterly somnambulant. What the humanities profess to do is to understand everything by putting it in its social, cultural, and historical context. And I have to say that my anthropological colleagues keep telling me this too. This is what they do, they say. We, we observe what people do, we do our participant observation, we get to know them really well, and then we understand, interpret, and even explain what they're doing by putting them in their social, cultural, and historical context. We, they say, we embed what people do in context. And I think of the unruly child who is supposed to be going to bed uh, at seven o'clock in the evening and keeps jumping up and leaping out of bed and waving his arms around and demanding attention. And what do we say to him? Get back into your context and be understood. That, that <laughs> putting things in context is a way of saying, Okay, we've dealt with them now. They're not a challenge anymore. That was then. It's all done, all understood. Now we can get on with real life. It is a way, actually, of taking things out of our presence and ticking them off. Uh, and so, between the maroon spacecraft of science and somnambulant humanities, something, something very important has got lost. And I think what has got lost is the presence of things. Uh, having things, people, whatever, the world, actually in front of us and challenging us by its very being there. The very presence of things is what we are losing, both to science and 
to the humanities. Because it's only when we acknowledge and recognize the presence of things before us that we can be curious about them, and only when we recognize that presence can we care about them. Only then can we actually have an ethical stance towards the world. I, I, the, an example of, of what I mean by this, which brings us to art, uh, that I like very much, comes from the, the writings of, uh, of the great pioneer of, of uh, modern abstract art, Vasily Kandinsky, um, in an essay wrote in the, in the 1930s, and he, he, he wrote this beautiful pastiche, this spoof, of, of an art exhibition. He imagines an art exhibition and, and all the uh, bourgeois um, ladies and gentlemen uh, going through it uh, with their little catalogue. And they're going through and they're looking up and well, on the wall there, there's, there's countess so-and-so and there are some cows in the field and there are some apples on a plate and there's a woman who doesn't happen to have any clothes on and there's this and there's a bowl of flowers and they look at this and they look at that and they look at their catalogue and say, oh, this was done by such and such an artist and he belonged to this movement and he wrote at this time and is influenced by these people. And at the end, they all come out and they can tell you, these visitors to the exhibition, everything you need to know about every work of art. And if they've forgotten, they can check it up in the book. And Kandinsky says, why ever did they go? Have any of them actually seen any art? Have any of them actually been moved by any art? Have they seen anything at all? And, uh, uh, and his problem simply is, is that if, if the way you deal with art is as the art historian does, which is perfectly legitimate, you know, why did this person paint this particular picture, when, uh, what was his biography, who was, who was influencing the artist and so on, that's all fine, but it's got nothing to do with this work as art, because in order to perceive work as art, you have to allow that art into your presence and not to put it away in a cultural, historical context. In anthropology, we have exactly the same problem. Uh, it's why I've been fighting a bit of a campaign within my own discipline to argue for a distinction between anthropology and ethnography. Because ethnography tends to do uh, just the same as what art history does. It wants to understand everything by putting it in its context, and in that way to take away the very presence of those people from whom you learn, and that can be so challenging to one's own understandings of what it means to be. So all of that uh, leads me to the, the, the word that is the, the, the center of my title, which is about the importance of attending to things. To bring things into presence is not to, in, it's not to interpret, it's not to understand, it's not to explain, it's to attend, to pay attention to what is there. And by that attention, I don't mean um, what you could call a say a stop and check, like at, at a roadblock, hands up, uh, attention means um, that you, you were doing something, but you've got to stop, and stop and then check, and then, okay, then you can carry on again. I don't mean attention in that sense, I mean attention in the sense of, of going along together. Um, uh, the, the word itself comes from Latin, ad, ad, ad tendere, which means to stretch towards. So attention is a kind of stretching. You know how um, when, you, uh, when you listen to something, and, and listening, of course, is a, is a key form of attention. Never mind if you can't see this at the back, but I'll, I'll guess to you, it's, it's all right. But, but, but we tend to imagine, you know, that, that, that we have a head here with, with ears that are that are locked in, locked into the head. But I'm sure you have that experience that when you're actually listening to something, you don't feel your head is like that. And you think that your ears are, are like this, stretching out, <laughs> stretching out to, for, for what you're listening for, so that, so that you, um, you're not a body with, um, with ears locked into it. Anatomically, you become what some people call an ear body. Your, you, you, your body is an ear, and the ear is stretching out to what it is, what it is listening for. That's what I mean by, uh, by attention. 
Uh, and, it's, and it means thinking of the body in a way very different from the anatomical sense. You know, anatomically, we might say, you know, I have a head, a trunk, legs, arms, and, and in the head there are two eyes and two ears and a nose and the rest of it. We could, we could describe ourselves anatomically as a, as, a, as a set of organs, structures, that are bound together, articulated in a fairly uh, coherent way. But thinking about the body in attention, it no longer becomes an anatomical unity, but an affective one. We become, the body becomes a bundle of affects that are stretching out in all sorts of directions. And, and, and if there's a coherence to it, it's something like the coherence of a knot when you tie lots of strands together and they're bundled together at, at the centre. For example... Um, apart from doing anthropology, uh, a thing I, I, I do is uh, is play the cello. And and, um, and when I get my cello out and I sit down, uh, ready to play, and there I am, and the cello fits very naturally between my legs here, and there's a spike at the bottom which which digs into the ground, and and there I all am. And, and somebody might say, okay, there's a there's an anatomical unity there. I'm actually um, anatomically connected up to my cello, I've become something like a centaur, you know, half human, half cello, that is, that is down together. But at the moment I begin to play, that completely falls apart. Everything falls apart. And instead, I become, uh, the, the anatomical unity collapses, so that I then reconstitute myself as a bundle of affects. I don't see a cello, I don't see my body. I see sound, air, metal, rosin, string, hair, all flying in different directions. And out of all that comes something that we call a musical performance. So that's what happens in attention. Uh, and I spoke earlier about participant observation, and I'll come back to the observation side in a moment, but um, I want just to say a, a word or two about the kind of participation that is involved in this, the sort of participation that is involved in what I have called correspondence. Because today, participation also has become one of those one of those words, it's a good thing. You know, we should all be participating. We saw everything has to be participatory. Participatory design, participatory planning, participatory this, participatory education. Or sometimes it's, it's delivered in terms of, say, child-centered education or user-centered research or whatever. Um, that's not I mean, that's not the kind of participation that, we're talk that I'm talking about with correspondence because largely it means fitting in with what the other is doing or perhaps getting everybody else to fit in with you. A genuine participation is one that is transformative, that is not just a matter of, of, of adapting to... Um, whatever requirements are out there, but of carrying on a conversation in which all parties stand to be transformed. Such as in, in any conversation, uh, you and I are having a conversation and uh, it's, it's moving us both along and it's transformative uh, for, for both of us. I got this idea from the writings of, of John Dewey, a great educationalist and philosopher, the uh, early part of the of the, the, the 20th century. Strangely, um, strangely un, unread nowadays, uh, where where Dewey too was argue, talking about education and arguing that education has to be participatory. But participation is only educational if it's transformative for all involved, not just for one side rather than the other. And this is really critical. So participant observation for anthropologists and others is a way of working. In that sense, we could call it a method. But it is absolutely not a methodology. And this distinction between method and methodology, I think, is very important. Because method is a way of working with things, a way of working with things, of going along with them, learning from them, responding to them. 
Methodology, however, at least in the sense in which it is commonly understood today, methodology is a way of holding things at arm's length, keeping a distance from them as a guarantor of objectivity. It is a form not of bringing things into our presence, but a form of immunization so that the results of our research are not tainted by too close a contact with the things we study. So methodology in that sense, systems, protocols for holding things at a distance, for making sure that there is no personal contact with what we study, methodology is the enemy of correspondence. Now, I think I talked earlier about the neoliberal econ neo economy of knowledge. Uh, and I think that, and that of course has given rise for, uh, to, to, to an ever more intense competition for innovation and what is called, and I'm sorry to use this word, excellence, it used to be a perfectly nice word, and you know, you just say that actually, yeah, I want to do an excellent job, and now you can't use it anymore because it's been hijacked. But this, this, it, but this competition for innovation and excellence has driven a kind of methodological arms race that draws scientists ever further from the phenomena they profess to study into a world of their own making. But in the end of the day, you cannot have science without observation. That if, if, if science is going to relate to the world at all, and sometimes, sometimes I do wonder uh, about science, whether in fact it has drawn us into a world so much of its own making that it doesn't really correspond to the world we inhabit at all. I thought when the great crash, the great financial crash happened in 2008 because it was revealed that all this money that people were talking about was actually a figment of people's imagination, I thought that maybe the same thing would happen very soon uh, for science. Uh, that was a time when the uh, Great Hadron Collider had just been built and scientists were boasting about how they'd built the biggest man machine that mankind had ever known uh, and you know there was a mouse this mouse is my hero the mouse who uh, ate through bit through the main electricity cable that powered the great hadron collider and put it out of action for 6 months that mouse was a, was 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 heroic in bringing uh, these inflated uh, uh, ideas uh, slightly down, down to earth but um, but anyway, big science hasn't collapsed yet, um, though I suspect after a while that it will, because you cannot have any real science without observation. Uh, and, and to have observation, there has to be some kind of engagement between the investigator and the things that he or she is studying. And to, and to highlight these observational commitments... I think means recovering those experiential and performative engagements which methodology goes to such lengths to cover up. I mean, for any practical project of science, you cannot actually hold things at a complete distance. You have to involve yourself with them. But methodology comes in to try and pretend that you're not doing so. And this has a bearing on what we mean when we talk about experiments, because of course there's a relationship between the word experiment and experience. In science, the experiment tends to be uh, a setup. It's something designed to actually to trick the world into revealing what it otherwise would not through some form of deceit and subterfuge, or sometimes through brute force. It is, in a sense, a test. We talk about experimental testing. So one is putting, one is designing a setup in which some aspect of the world in which you are interested in is, is put to the test. So whatever is put to the test has to undergo something. The test is something that your apparatus, your whatever it is you're studying, undergoes, but that undergoing is framed within the doing of the, exper of the experiment. Art is experimental too, but in quite the other way about. 
Because in art, the experiment is an experience enacted. That's to say, it's not a matter of testing a preconceived hypothesis, but simply of trying something out and seeing what happens. And of course, all life is experimental in that sense. As we go through life every day, every waking moment, we are trying things out and seeing what happens. As indeed, as I, my wife and I were trying to get here from the metro, and you know, we, we tried it out to get a ticket one way, and then didn't had to go. And anyway, we found our way here, but there was a lot of trial and error involved in it, and the result is that we, we, actually, we actually got here. So all life is experimental in that sense. And I think we can get at this difference between the scientific and the artistic experiment by looking at the relationship between two key terms, and that is doing and undergoing. Um, and again, I got this, these, uh, I got much of this from, from reading John Dewey's, um, I think from 1934, Art as Experience, in which he really focuses on the relationship between uh, doing and, and undergoing. Because in the, in the scientific experiment, I said that you're doing a test, and whatever you're testing has to undergo something. So there's, a, there's an undergoing here. I'll just call it UG. But that undergoing is framed within the doing of the experiment. So we start the experiment here. We end the experiment there. And, and so this is a doing. You're doing the experiment. But within that doing, there's the undergoing of whatever it is you are testing. But Dewey's point is that in, in life, it's the other way around. That undergoing is not framed within doing, but doing is always framed within undergoing. That is to say, there is always an overflow of experience that goes on beyond the... the, the, um, the uh, of any particular doing. So you could draw it more like this, that here is one doing, And here is another doing that's opened up. And that's within the overall process of undergoing. So what's happening there is that, um, is that undergoing, in a sense, digests the ends of doing and extrudes them into a new beginning. And the artist often, or the maker, is sitting here in the middle, in a sense taking one life and being at that moment of transformation in which it starts a new life. And one example is, uh, that comes from anthropology is, is, is um, uh, from a very famous study by Bronislaw Malinowski of, uh, of people living in the Trobriand Islands, and he writes about, about the making of, of ocean-going canoes. And this starts with a tree growing in the, in the forest. And, and people see that tree, that's going to make a good canoe, the hull of the canoe. So then um, th there's the tree. The tree's living its tree form of life. But along come the villagers. They, they cut down the tree. They haul it back to the village. The canoe builder gets to work in, in hollowing it out. And then it's carried to the beach. And then it is launched on the sea. And at that moment, it begins a new life as a canoe, now it's the same tree trunk, but now it's riding the waves rather than living in the forest. So the canoe builder stands at the threshold here from the life of the tree in the forest to the life of the tree as a canoe in the sea. Uh, a potter stands at the threshold between where the clay exists in the soil and clay starts its new life as a pot. The carpenter at the threshold between the trees in the woods and furniture in the building and so on. So in order to, uh, to, to, to get to, to this sense of the experiment, we have to put the relation between undergoing and doing in reverse. And that has uh, a bearing on the question of observation and, objecti and objectivity. Because I want to argue that um, if, if observing is a part of undergoing, then observing things is not 
to objectify them. This is a mistake is very commonly made that that if you're going to observe, you must it must mean that you're kind of standing outside and looking at things from a distance and objectifying thing, things. But this is not the case. To observe is to correspond, literally in the sense I set out. It's to watch, to listen, to follow closely what is going on, and to respond in time, in kind. And that is why there is no contradiction between participation and observation. This is something we're always told as students, so there's one of the problems with anthropology. We do participant observation, but you can't actually do that because it's contradictory. You know, how can you participate and observe at the same time? It's like asking somebody to jump in the river and stand on the banks at the same time. You, you have to move backwards and forwards between the two. But actually, it, there, there is no contradiction between them. The idea that there is a contradiction is just one aspect of a contradiction that lies at the heart of our own sense of humanity. I mean, the, the human is an extraordinarily contradictory term because we don't know whether it refers to um, just a, a particular species of nature or a condition of being that stands outside of nature. And I think actually the best definition of the human is that it expresses the existential dilemma of a being that can only know itself for what it is by standing outside itself. And, and there's this peculiar dilemma. And, and that is also what lies behind the idea that you can't participate and observe at the same time. That is to say, to observe, to know ourselves, we imagine we have to stand outside in order to have any knowledge. Because we assume that knowledge can only be gained from the outside of things. Um, and what I want to argue for is the reverse, and that is that actually all knowledge must grow from the inside of our involvement in the world that has made us be and allowed us to be the persons who we are. So this is the fundamental problem with science, that, that it, it, it is founded on a dilemma that it tells us that we are parts of the world, and yet it can only have the knowledge it has by saying that as scientists we stand outside the world. So we need to be able to show how knowledge can grow from the inside of being, from the crucible of our participatory and observational involvement with the world around us, that is, within the give and take of life. And of course that takes us right back to the issue of data from which I began. And it takes us also to the idea of research, which is a central um, topic for this conference. Uh, research, again, is one of those words that has become used and abused to the point that no one any longer knows exactly what it means, or it's lost its grounding. And I want to insist that research is and must be the pursuit of truth. If we, lo if we lose that... If we say, oh, truth, that's too hot, it's hot to handle, I don't know what truth is, then we, we lose any grounding for research as a legitimate and ethical activity. Now, of course, there are all sorts of ways of defining truth. But here is mine. Truth, I argue, is the unison of imagination and experience in a world to which we are alive and that is alive to us. That means that truth depends on our full and unqualified participation in the world, from which it follows, too, that truth is absolutely not the same as objectivity. These are very different things. And I think at the moment we are in grave danger of conflating truth and objectivity because of the current panic about post-truth. Uh, nobody wants post-truth, but most of the people, most of the commentators who are warning us of the dangers of a post-truth era in which sort of anything goes, in which using the data one can invent any kind of story, is that they're assuming that truth means pure and simple objective fact. 
It was a pure and simple objective fact that there were more people at Obama's inauguration than at Trump's. Okay, and you know, it was post-truth to pretend otherwise. But if that is all we mean by truth, how many people were at the inauguration? Was it this number or that number? Then that is a very, very reduced, a very impoverished sense of what truth is. And I think it's a real challenge, and this is a challenge for art as much as anything, to insist upon what truth means beyond the mere facts of objectivity. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, the chemist Friedrich August Kekulé, he was the one who discovered the circular structure of the benzene molecule, famously told about how he had a dream in which he saw snakes, a snake uh, writhing around and eating its own tail, and he woke up from the dream and there was the structure of the benzene molecule already in his head. He might have made that up. But anyway, he, he then gave a lecture towards the end of his career advising young scientists as to how to do it, and he said this. I like it very much. He said to the, to the aspiring scientist, note every footprint, every bent twig, every fallen leaf, and there you will see where next to place your feet. So, and, and then he called this way of doing science as though you're, you're, you're going walking very delicately through, a, through the woods and noting every twig, every, every fallen leaf, and then deciding, yes, that's the next place to put your feet. He called that pathfinding, and he thought of science as a, as, as a pathfinding, or I would call it wayfaring. And the thing is that the pathfinder corresponds with things in their formation rather than being informed by what has already precipitated out. The pathfinder doesn't just collect, but accepts what the world has to offer because he is paying acute attention to everything. And I think it's here, rather than, rather than in arrogating to itself the authority to represent a given reality, it is here that science can join with art as a way of knowing in being. That is that in practice, the hands and minds of scientists just like the hands and minds of artists, absorb into their ways of working a perceptual acuity attuned to the materials that have captured their attention. And so as these materials vary, so does experience. And what that suggests is that in practice, scientists are differentiated by their actual experience of working with stuff. That a glaciologist really having spent so much time with ice, really appreciates, in, in, in a tactile, haptic way, the qualities of ice. He's almost looking at ice with icy eyes. And a, and a, a, a botanist or a, or a mycologist, as my dad was, would, would, would look at fungi with, with eyes that already have a sort of fungal quality inside them. And that was the science that I grew up with as the son of a mycologist in my childhood, in which we were, I and my, my, um, my peers were, 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 were felt a, a sort of wonder in the beauty of the natural world. It was, a, it was a science founded in care, in attentiveness, and in gratitude for what we owe the world for our existence. What concerns me now is that science, as it is presented to school children today, has turned wonder and gratitude into commodities. They no longer guide its practices, or they no, no longer guide the practices of science, but are used to, um, but are used to advertise its results. So that more and more, science has listed art in order to promote its hard sell, to offer images that beautify its results, that soften its impact, and mask often its collusions with corporations whose only interest in research is that it should drive innovation. Because in a neoliberal economy of knowledge, only what is new sells. Scientists often talk about the importance of what they call blue sky research, of just being able to study anything because it's interesting. And yet, 
the rhetoric of blue sky research divorces that entirely legitimate curiosity about the world. It divorces that curiosity from care. Why should, this is what they say, why should scientists care how their results are used? That's not their concern. Scientists say, we do the research. We do the research because the world is there and we are curious about it. Of course our results might be used to build bombs or to make medicines or whatever. That's not our job. That's for politicians. We just do the research. But this kind of, this, this kind of, 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 of rhetoric shows the lofty appeal to, to blue skies to be little more than a self-serving defence of special interests increasingly concentrated in the hands of a global scientific elite that treats the rest of the world, including the vast majority of its increasingly impoverished and apparently disposable human population, as a standing reserve to feed the insatiable appetite of the knowledge economy. But we must care, and we care because truth matters. And science, if it's going to be ethical, must be the pursuit not of innovation, but of truth. And that means that truth, you remember the unison of imagination and experience in a world that is alive to us and uh, to which we are alive, that truth comes not after science, but before it in the humble recognition that we are ourselves beholden for our existence to the world we seek to know. And so we need to build a radical ecological awareness into the very foundations of science. So you remember my image of, of the marooned spaceship. While consuming vast resources... Science, I feel, has largely lost its way. It doesn't have any idea of where it has come from or where it is going. And that is why the world needs art. The world needs art to help science find its way again. Which means that art must come not after science, as a way of communicating scientific findings or beautifying its results. Art must come before science by bringing the spaceship back down to Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim, for inspiring, inspiring talk. And, and now we have uh, some time for, for questions. And I can hand down the microphone up there. Ah, there's already. Yep. Thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I'm curious as to if you have any thoughts on uh, something that I've been thinking a lot about, which is not the kind of notion of being so embedded in context on the one hand or the idea of distance on the other, but the idea of extraction. So if you think of sort of Bertolt Brecht and you know, the idea of making strange, and if you think of Duchamp and the famous bottle rack, you know, what the artist often does is you know, have a critical distance, right? So you take something, you resituate mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. you take a material, you transform it, you take an idea, you put it out of context in this other kind of arena, and that allows the audience or the viewer to have this encounter, right? Mm. So the art sort of happens as, you know, Simon O'Sullivan has really well articulated yeah, in yeah. his writing, you know, in that space between those two things. Mm. So I'm interested in how you think maybe of presence in relation to it not being, you know, presence as in you're really actually there in the world with the thing, but presence also as a kind of another form of extraction via attention specific mm. to the thing, but outside of all of the usual kind of ways in which you might yeah. encounter yeah. 
Absolutely, and 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 as, as I understand it, I mean the, the the sorts of examples you gave um, are, are precisely about how. Um, you bring something into presence that normally is simply doing its job in its in its ordinary context. You, know, the, 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 you go to the toilet and do a, do a pee, you know, and you don't really think about it, but you bring the thing out. You say, oh, "Goodness, I hadn't really thought about this before." So the the thing actually actually that 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 form of extraction is a is a way of exactly of taking things out of context ordinary context in order to, to bring them into your presence so that you attend to them in ways that you might not have done before. And what that, that suggests to me is that, um, is, is that somehow we have to distinguish between two senses of extraction and two senses of decontextualization because there's a, there's a kind of sense of extraction uh, which... Um, uh, which, which I mentioned talking about how scientists produce data uh, where, where you simply harvest the stuff. There's a, there's a kind of extraction which is, yeah, which is really just data harvesting. Uh, and um, and a, and a decontextualization that, that, that is related to that. And that's clearly something completely different from the kind of extraction that you were just talking about, which is to bring th something full front into, into our awareness. And, and likewise, um, there are two senses of, of decontextualization. And, and I don't think I could do it on my feet, but I, I think it, it, it would be important to try and finesse the terms so as to be clear about what that difference is. It might be that that one involves attention and the other doesn't, or something like that. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to put it, but you're absolutely right that, that there is a difference. And, mm. I think there was a question from here. Um, thanks, Matt, for your fascinating talk. Uh, my question is, in a way, a follow-up of the previous one. Um, we live in a context in which uh, things, knowledge, people become increasingly obsolete, um, surrounded by uh, overwhelming distractions. <clears throat> um, so it seems to me that one has to elaborate, one has to develop um, strategies or rituals for paying attention, sometimes defensive ones, sometimes generative ones. Perhaps we can even talk of a catalyst of attention. Uh, so I wonder if Professor Ingol um, has his own ritual or strategy <coughs> for, <coughs> for paying attention, perhaps, playing the cello. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know whether I have any. I, I don't know whether I have any such, such rituals, but um, but I do think you're right that um, we. Well, I think it, I think it's fairly obvious to everybody that, that that the world as it is at the moment is one in which people are paying less and less attention, and one of the reasons, um, the other side of attention, of course, is distraction, uh, and th that too is a word that can mean many different things. But but a lot of us would say that that people are, are completely distracted, for example, on their on their phones. They're not paying any attention to anybody because they're they're absorbed in their in their their phones, or they have uh, earplugs on their ears, so they're not listening to the birds or the sounds around them. So we, 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 we have a situation in which, in which so much of, of, of the sensory world has been commodified. So we don't actually actively have to, have to stretch out in order to listen, in order to watch, in order to see, because uh, the, these things are being fed, uh, mediated in some way, by, 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 by phones, television, whatever, are being fed directly into into us, and we become the consumers of um, of sensation rather than the producers of, of of our lives in a in a world. And so, I don't know what you're saying. In a way, is 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 that that attention is something that can be trained. It's not innate. It's not the given with it. it, it we, we can we can we can learn to be attentive and and so if you learn to play a musical instrument for example um then you 
uh, like a cello, well, one of the things you have to learn is, is to play in tune. And to play in tune, you have to be able to uh, be sensitive to, uh, to, to the slightest variations of pitch. And you can see this is out of tune, this is sharp, this is flat. And, and not everybody uh, you know, is, is attentive to those distinctions because it's, a, it's part of, um, of a skill. And, and different people have different skills and they attend to different things. And that's, that's fine. Um, but my worry is that, that because up until recently attention has always taken a back seat to intention um, in design, in philosophy and so on, um, it's, it's as though that doesn't really matter. Or as though, never mind about the important thing is about the intentionality of things. And, and, and I do think we have to reverse our priorities. Um, to pay more attention to it, pay more attention to attention, if you if, if you will. Yes, hello and thank you for your speech, Professor Ingold. My name is Olin Holm. I'm a master's degree student of social anthropology, and my question is this: that how do you answer to the crit critique that you had that uh, your emphasis on introspection uh, produces uh, the same kinds of bias uh, biases and uni universalizations that the evolutionists of the late 1900s produced? Uh, sorry, sir, I missed it. So, so I. Uh, I, you know, the reason why this was that one of the curious things about about um, the technology here is that it's very difficult to, to attention that that I was looking in completely the wrong direction, uh, because, <laughs> because uh, and and the result is that that I didn't actually pick up exactly. Could you say it again? Because then I can't see where you are. Where you are. Yes, sure. There you are. Okay, now I can Now I can attend. Yes, sorry about that. So yeah, uh, as I said, I'm a yeah. master's degree student of social anthropology and uh, my question is that uh, how do you answer to the critique that you've had on uh, the emphasis on the introspection on the research that uh, it might produce the same kinds of biases and universalizations that the evolutionists of the late 1900s produced? Um, first of all, um, uh, I, I, I'm no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see that. What, but, but, but on the other hand, um, those people who were writing in the, the those evolutionists in the late nineteenth century um, had a lot of wrong ideas, but, but, but they weren't. Com um, their, their ways of thinking deserve to be taken seriously. And um, one of the things that was, one of the things that distinguished the, the evolutionism of the late 19th century and the cultural relativism of, of the mid 20th is this, that, that evolutionists, for all their faults, and all their subscription to a rather ethnocentric kind of, uh, uh, you know, that what their universals always turned out to be um, white male universals and so on. But, but uh, um, is that they they felt that at least all human beings were part of that same process that we are all in it together. Um, it's just that you know, if you were a 19th century white male, you were you were you were further ahead than everybody else, but you were still in part of the same process. Whereas the relativists would say that um, all humanity is, is locked up in its cultural worlds, except us. And we can look into all these worlds, because we are not just ascendant, we are transcendent. So, in some sense, the, 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 the relativists of the 20th century were much more arrogant than the evolutionists of the 19th century, because they felt that they were really over and above cultural difference, so over and above it that they could look into all these different cultural worlds. Whereas, so they could see in, but the people in the cultures couldn't see out. But at least the evolutionists, for all their uh, arrogance, ethnocentrism, and the rest of it, felt, had a sort of commitment to the idea that, that there was a, a universality in the sense that we are all part of the same world. And I think it's terribly important for anthropology and indeed art and everything else to recognize this, that we are, the, the world might be a world of infinite and never-ending difference, but we are all part of it. And that's a 
less, it's, it's that, in that sense of universality, I think is something that we can take from those 19th century thinkers, without having to say that it means in some sense we're all the same. I don't think there's any sense in the notion of universal human nature, no, but there is a sense in saying that, um, that we, all, we all inhabit the same world of relations and processes, and whatever differences there are are generated within that. I don't know whether that answers your question, but anyway, it's the best I can do. Okay, um, thank you. We are running uh, over, over the schedule a little bit, but I promised one more very, very quick question, so here it goes. Yeah, I'm like a kid. When I need to do something, I have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I understood, if I have understood, that you relate the true to presence, but we are sure that we can be present. In the sense that, for example, before we have done a sort of involuntary intervention, he passed me the, the microphone and he started to speak. Yeah. And you didn't know yeah. where you were yes. and who you were and what your experience was in that, in that moment. So it's not that our subjectivity instead is built by the space-time organization so that our sense of presence is already constructed. Instead, our true being is on the edge between presence and non-presence. In fact, if you put a situation that is in homeostatic equilibrium like this, out of equilibrium, you have sort of chaos coming, and you don't your, your experience is more on the age of presence. Mm. You are not really present. It's become some timely and spacely, your, your, your experience. So it's more near to the mystic than to mm. the graspable. Mm -hmm. In fact, for example, I usually put system out of equilibrium to make intervention. And I see if I go to reconstruct this experience, I need to use fiction. Because the subjectivity of the situation is so extended at the limit of cosmic, mm. so that you cannot really be present ag again on in, the, in that non-presence. Okay, um, that, that actually Very is a really, really, really question. interesting and impo an important question. I mean, the, the, the first thing I want, to, I, I, I sort of agree with you. I certainly agree in the sense that presence can only be relational. That is to say that it's not something that, here am I, you know, I just come with my presence and I'm, I'm here. And, and, and that's it. And you've got to accept it as what it is. But, that, um, and, and that example of what just happened with the microphone, you know, I missed it because I was looking in completely the wrong direction, was, was exactly that, that... that um, for, for a moment, the speaker was not present to me, uh, and, and therefore I couldn't form a relation, and therefore I couldn't hear what he said. So, so, that, so that when we talk about presence, it has to be relational. I mean, that, that seems to me to be... And that, that was my problem with the notion of qualitative data, for example. That the, but... but, but um, then, then there's the question about, then, then all, the second thing, was, uh, so first presence has got to be relational, second surely it is processual or, or temporal, uh, that's to say that it's not, it's not a, you know, here it is, it's, it's, not a, it's, it's not in the here and now, it's something that is continually, so in, in, in a sense it's, it's a continually becoming present, a continual appearing and, and so perhaps a word like appearance would be better than presence. And I have a feeling um, that there was this wonderful discussion by a, a Goethean uh, philosopher called, called Henri Bertoft, who, uh, who said that although grammatically we talk about, we would say, it appears, he said that philosophically speaking, it would be better to say, appears it. Which means that he had what he meant was that somehow you are brought to that point at, at, at which you are at that cusp on which something is about to reveal itself for what it is. You are at the at the at the appearing of what appears, and and you might say that the presence in this kind of way you were talking about is saying where where something it's not there, it's just just coming to be there, and you're catching it at that moment and if you don't catch it it disappears like a dream it disappears when you when you wake up so that one is one is living on that cusp um, 
you talk about between presence and absence, presence and non-presence. I would say it's, it's that cusp in which, in which the world is continually on the point of revealing itself for what it is. Uh, and that, that's very interesting. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it kind of appears that we are running out of time. And, and uh, so uh, I once again want to thank uh, Tim Ingold for inspiring talk. And, and uh, paying attention is important, but coffee is also important. And there's going to be some served. So thank you.